Hey, it's Damon. Just a quick note of sincere thanks to Kelly for her recent contribution to the Who Am I Really podcast on Patreon. She said in her donation message that she doesn't have a direct connection to the world of adoption, but she appreciates how much she's learned from listening to adoptee stories. We appreciate you for listening to us. And I hope some of you will take a moment to go to patreon.com slash WAI really right now to help support bringing more adoptee stories to light. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash W-A-I really. All right, now it's time for this week's show. I'm seeing these pictures of, of my mom with other people that, especially with my biological siblings, and I'm not there. Where do I fit in this picture? I'm thinking, I, I still don't fit in. I, I'm never in any of these pictures. And there's that little voice in the back of my head was saying that. I, then I began to, I don't fit in here anymore. I almost kind of regretted locating them because now you have this new feeling of, I'm never going to fit in here. Who am I? 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 This is Who Am I Really? A podcast about adoptees that have located and connected with their biological family members. I'm Damon Davis, and you're about to meet Roderick. He chatted with me from Ocala, Florida. Roderick was adopted into a family where he was the middle child, but he would become the parent to his younger siblings. Focusing on their well-being, he sacrificed his own advancement. In reunion, he found siblings he had never thought of before, then experienced secondary rejection from an aunt in Indiana. That rejection came after Roderick found a full-blood sibling in Florida and decided to move there to be closer to her. This is Roderick's journey. Roderick was born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana. His family had already had two older biological girls from his parents, one four years older than Roderick, the other six years older. I I remember my very first thought of meeting them at a park. They came to a park to, I guess, interact with me at some point. And I must have not ever gone down a slide because I remember this distinctly, going trying to go down a slide and get afraid and jumping off the side of it. I was only four then. Wow. That was my first memory. And my next memory is going to the actual house to, to actually be living with them. And I remember being in the car with this social worker. I had chewing gum, you know, the old spearmint chewing gum. And mm-hmm. I was supposed to save some for the two girls when I got there. Instead, I was so nervous I ate it all. And I was really confused, like, oh, are they going to be mad at me if you're eating all this stuff? No, no, it'll be fine. <laughs> so I reached the door, and here's these two bubbly little girls popping their heads out behind the the parents, and then the first thing they want me to do is go make chocolate chip cookies. So this, to this day, chocolate chip cookies are my favorite. Nice. I love it. That's really funny. Tell me, when you met them at the park, was this like a transition day? Was this adoption day for you? No, I don't believe that was adoption day. I mean, I don't know the full story, but I do remember it distinctly. I want to ask my adoptive parents about that. They vaguely remember it. They, they think it was just a day where they got to meet me outside the foster home because I was adopted when I was age four, given up at birth. So I was at that time in a, in a foster care, obviously, somewhere. I don't recall any of those, but obviously I did. Gotcha. So you were adopted at age four. Yes, yeah, I had medical problems when I was born. So my birth mother left me at the hospital, and she actually believed that I had died at the hospital. She didn't think I was even alive anymore. So Wow. Roderick was adopted at age four. By the time he was seven years old, his parents were divorced. The wonderful family he was adopted into was disbanded a few short years after his arrival. Roderick's adopted mother worked in a bar, and she was never home. She went on to have two more children, a boy and a girl, and in his preteen years, Roderick raised his younger siblings. Their mother was never home. She wasn't abusive. She neglected the children. Roderick reported his younger brother was so hungry, he ate sticks of butter and ketchup. Here I am, a preteen, trying to figure out how to basically raise my younger siblings. And, you know, obviously I wasn't giving that instruction. Right. They never complained later in life. They said I did as good as I could, but... Sure. 
Do you remember the first time you really thought to yourself, man, I'm I'm kind of parenting these kids. Like, where's mom? Do you remember the first sort of set of feelings where you just kind of questioned, like, I don't think this is supposed, this isn't the way this is supposed to go. It was pretty pretty much straight on because, again, she was gone so much that it immediately was thrown into that, even to the point where if they got sick, I was I was forced to stay home from school and watch them. So it was pretty obvious that I was the one raising them. Wow. That's unbelievable. It's fascinating. So you, there were two older ones, and where were the they younger. while you were parenting the two younger ones? Yeah, they left. They left and stayed with the father, and, and then she got their own place. But yeah, they were, one of them was six years older than me, and I'm like, what, 12 at the time. And the younger ones are much younger than me. I was the middle child, oh, but then I became the oldest child because obviously I was left to raise the two younger ones. How did that impact your schooling? Because I think to myself as a parent, you know, it's challenging enough for me to get myself up, get a workout in, get to shower, like make my son's lunch, drive him across town oh, no. to school. Like, how this did you... The days before, before they actually had truant officers and things like that. I mean, obviously, when I went to school, they didn't come looking for you for whatever reason. They do now, but they didn't come looking for you. So I was allowed to miss multiple, multiple, lots of days and basically failed many classes and had to go back. I didn't graduate originally from the high school that I was trying for. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to go back and make up that credit on my own later on as an adult. The irony is I'm such a nerd that days that I would cut or stay home, because sometimes I cut. You know, I just At this point, I was so far behind, I didn't, I didn't really even want to go to school. So when I cut, I would actually go to the library, check out books on science and history, and, and take them and read them on my own. That's how nerdy I am. That's fantastic. I mean, how fortuitous <laughs> that you were that nerdy that you could get yourself an education on the off days. That's really unbelievable. As, adopt, as adoptees, we have to understand that there's two parts of us. There's either the nature and the nurture. So it's obviously the part where all the things that happen to us is going to influence us. And then there's the part where we're innately who we are. And at that time, I didn't know that. But, but looking back now, I see, oh, no matter what they did to me, I already had this desire and curiosity to learn so that didn't come from any parenting roderick didn't graduate high school with his class he was a good student when he was present but his life prevented him from excelling in the normal fashion and there was no way to catch up roderick said he had nightmares of being 25 years old and still being in high school he was forced to go back and earn his ged his younger sister developed leukemia when she was eight years old she didn't graduate high school either but his younger brother continued to excel, remained with their mother until he was 18 years old, and graduated from college. What do you think about when you reflect on your inability to get your own education because she was absent and neglected you, and your brother, and the fact that you got your brother to a place where he was solid enough that he could actually get through? I mean, you were a child raising another child. What, what comes to mind well, when you think about that? Well, I'm a big believer in all things happen for a reason. And I know sometimes we like to look back and say, well, you know, things could be different if this happened and that happened. Like, things would be different if somebody would have, you know, hey, you, you can do this and you can get in this program. I, I had the aptitude. It just didn't. I was so far behind. It wasn't going to work. I had, when I was in seventh grade, I was in college-level English classes. So I believe it all worked out for good. I mean, I, I got a different perspective of the world. I'm not, I'm not bitter or regretting any of that, and I actually was successful. And I'm, as we'll get into this later, I'm, I'm an author and have written, you know, nine books, so I'm okay with it. So yeah, I was just, I was not necessarily looking for you to lament your upbringing as much as maybe celebrate the fact that you, in a neglectful adoptive situation, were basically able to help raise another child. I mean, I think that's really amazing. Yeah, and again, we talked about nature nurture. I don't really pat myself on the back like, oh, well, I learned it. Maybe I did, but I don't pat myself like, I, I did all this. I think it's just part of in a certain parts of humans. They, they, they excel and they, they succeed despite the odds. And, and I chalk it up to that more so than, hey, I pat myself on the back. Yeah. It was always going to happen, what I believe. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I appreciate your humility for the whole situation, too. But it is a, it, it, it's a big deal. And uh, and I think I hope that your brother's thankful for the how far he's gotten, you know. Yeah, he seems to be. He seems to be very, very that's, much so. That's I mean, great. There's lots of things, even just the small things, like 
my dad had an old pool table that was had some bad bumpers on it and stuff. We used to play pool, and, and I would never let him win, and he'd get so mad as a little kid. He was like, you know, I said, he's eight, and I'm maybe 15. I can't remember exactly what age, but he would get mad. But because I pushed him to, to be better than me, he always, to this day, he's better than me in all things, sports, pool, and everything else. Coming into a family at four years old, Roderick always knew he was adopted. There were certain times where he questioned who he really was, as he was different from his adopted family. While his family had brown hair, Roderick was a blonde when he was younger, and he has very thick lips by his own description, like to the point that he wondered if there was African-American roots in his background. One thing that was strange as I was growing up is more so that I always felt like an observer, watching everybody else live their life and paying attention to them. I never felt like I was really a participant because I didn't have any connection or origin. I couldn't say, hey, my uh, origin's from here. I'm from this place, and here's my ancestors. So I always felt like, okay, I'm just going to watch everybody else do their life. Roderick's search began in pre-internet days, adding his name to adoption message boards, but those were practically shots in the dark that didn't go anywhere. His search had fits and starts. Then, in 2017, when he was 50 years old, he got the news that Indiana changed its laws. If biological parents gave approval, the adoptee could access their full records. Also, if the biological parents were deceased, the records were made available upon request. Before that law change, Roderick had sent away for his non-identifying information years before, so he knew his birth mother was from Kentucky, what her age would have been, and how much he weighed when he was born. But that was it. Roderick applied for his information again, expecting he wouldn't get much more than he already knew. What he got was his birth certificate and his birth mother's name. When it came back, it was, it was, it was strange because it was almost surreal. Because this is the day that my wife and I were going to go see the president, the, the previous president, speak at a rally. And so the letter came, but I didn't really open it. And I was like, oh, I'll open this when I get done because i got more important things to do right now. I'll check it out later. So it was kind of weird. So here I'm at this president's rally and all this, you know, big hubbub. And my whole mind is thinking about, what does that letter say? What's in that letter? And is it going to reveal anything? This is what's going on in my mind. When here the president of the free world is, is speaking, it doesn't really matter to me. It's so small in this, in this instance. And then when I get home and open up and see my, my mom's actual name, and all this other stuff. Of course, I didn't have a name at birth. I was given up at birth, so it just said male. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no name. I still, to this day, I still wonder who gave me my name. Was it the foster parents? Where did I get my name from? Yeah. My original birth name. So, that is and then within, within two days, I had located uh, biological relatives using the internet. That's unreal. So, 50 years old, Indian, Indiana's laws have changed. And right. you're able to petition for access to your original birth certificate, and you got it. And now you have your bi biological mother's name. Name. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was there a biological so, father on it. Yes. Wow. That's and really. So I do a search on the internet, and at first I didn't find much. I mean, I found that she was dead and deceased. I found that she had some siblings, and they were also deceased. I was like, oh. This is going nowhere. She's all the persons she's related to are going nowhere. And finally, I found that she had married a, a man, and he had a really distinct name. It was, it sounded like French. I was like, well, I'll do a Facebook check. I mean, there can't be too many people in this area. Sure enough, I located a nephew of mine. I sent him a message on Facebook, and I, and I said, hey, are you related to such and such? The mother, you know. He goes, yeah, that was my grandma. Like, oh my God! Then my heart just dropped. Like, I have located a relative, a birth relative. And I told him I typed to him because I'm typing to him. I was like, uh, "Are you sitting down?" He goes, "No." I said, um, "I think I might be a long lost son," which I knew, but I don't, you know, kind of drop it easy, so it ain't crazy. And there was just no reply at all. I was like, "Oh my God!" I scared this guy away. And he comes back finally. You know, seems like I'm turning to you later and types, "Is this Rodney?" Your sister's been looking for you. Now, I wasn't even thinking anything about siblings. I was looking for mothers and fathers. I, I didn't, for some reason, my, didn't enter my mind that I actually might have biological siblings. Right. I wasn't really looking for them. Yeah. And I'm like, sister, sister, who's the sister? What sister? Yes, your sister. She's been looking for you. wants to talk to you. I was like, I have a sister. You know, I'm typing radically, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so he gives me, I give him my number, and within, you know, 10 minutes, 
I'm talking to her, and she's basically opening up my entire life because she's telling me who my mother was and, and how it happened and that I have two other biological brothers or sisters who are older than me. It's just amazing. It's because it's just immediate. It wasn't slow. And I know some counselors, well, counselors, you need to go slow. It's too much. It's too overwhelming. And for some people, maybe, maybe it is. But because I had this disconnected, non-familial familial ties, I, I was an observer, and I'm really kind of not emotional. At least I keep the ocean motions inside. Mm-hmm. It didn't affect me as much as it might affect other people in, in re- regards to making me just break down and crying and, and not being able to function. But it was amazing. That's really fascinating. And you're right. This is something that a lot of adoptees do. We, You think about where you came from, right? I have these parents, right. but who were the people that brought me into the world? And sometimes you just don't take the extra step to think, and what other children might they have had? Some people do. They're like, I need to find my family because I could have brothers and sisters. But a lot of people don't. They, they like Our thought process is, let me find my parents. And then everything else well, that comes since, after that is such a surprise. Since I came from a family of five, so there was five of us, so I didn't really think about siblings. I didn't need siblings. I already had enough of them. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Wow. Yeah. So this, this nephew of yours has said, your sister's looking for you. Right. And then what happened? Did he connect you with her? Tell me what happened next. So she calls me, and she, again, is this Rodney? And then she says, is Renee with you? I said, Renee who? Renee, you're our other sister. I was like, we have another sister? But again, I didn't know anything about this. Because their story was that, again, either I died in the hospital, or that I was so badly impaired that I was uh, mentally and physically impaired and, and, and turned in somewhere in an institution. They, and again, I was unhealthy at the time. I'm fine now, but as a baby, I was really unhealthy. So they didn't really, she wasn't really looking for me so much as she was looking for this other sister who is, who is uh, two years older than me. Like, no, I don't know anything about her. And so that causes another chapter of this whole story here because nobody had really looked for her beyond what they could do at the time. And I ended up finding her, this biological sister. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you found her after you continued to talk with this other half sister. So tell me more about what this half sister you've been ad- introduced to says. So the half sister believed that I was given up for adoption and the older sister was given up for adoption at birth. I was confused by this because this was where maybe adoptees go through. Why would a woman give away two kids, let alone one kid? You know, I, we kind of rationalize, okay. She was young, she, you know, had a hard life, but now you have two kids that she's given up with a span of two years apart. Mm-hmm. So I try not to, I'm trying to say, okay, I don't understand, and I'm not going to hold it against her. She's deceased, so that's one thing, and I can't even talk to the mother, so I can't ask her any questions. So that's what's playing on your mind. Why is this other daughter also given up, and what kind of person does that? And so the younger sister tried to tell me how much turmoil, so badly that the mother actually had to go to uh, not a mental institution, but some facility for a while because she had breakdowns often. Because she, for whatever reason, she you know she lost her baby. She gave him up. Yeah. So this actually had an impact on her. You know, it was an easy thing for her to do. Roderick felt an immediate need to be with his people. He called his middle brother, and they talked on the phone for quite a while. This man Roderick didn't even know was opening up about his life in very personal ways, as if they had known one another for a long time. Roderick was bonding with his sibling, and he wanted more. Wow, this guy's just revealing all kinds of stuff to me, like a little brother. It's like he knows me. <laughs> well, I found that strange at first. But within a day or so out later, I have this urge to see them. I, I, I can't concentrate. I can't work. I can't do anything. I need to see you guys face to face. They live in the, in the same city, Indianapolis, just probably half an hour away. It, so I said, this might be a little strange, but can you come to my house and meet me? And they jumped on it right away, and these two, the two of them came and met me. The older brother, like I told you, was already standoffish. He didn't want me to contact the kids there. And, so he, and he also lived further away, so he didn't approach me yet. But these two came within two days, and we sat in my house for three or four hours just talking and, and getting to know each other, so it was amazing. That's unreal. And as I looked at them, you, you see yourself in there, your, your, your eyes, the way your eyes are shaped and the way your mouth is shaped and all these things. You start seeing yourself in your, in your siblings. It's just crazy. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, I mean, 
and they're sitting in your house. I mean, that must have been absolutely nuts. Tell me about what it was like to see them. Like, what did you guys talk about for three hours? Well, again, she tell me more and more stories. She brought some pictures of, of, of my mom and, and our mom. And what was funny is that they kept correcting themselves as they were telling me the story. Our mom, they said, my mom, and they were correcting, oh, our mom, you know, because they wanted to make sure I was included. That's so cool. That's the first thing I noticed. They kept correcting themselves saying our mom. And so here I'm seeing these pictures for the very first time of my mom, and it's just amazing. But at the same time, I'm seeing these pictures of, of my mom with other people, that, especially with my biologic siblings, and I'm not there. Where do I fit in this picture? I'm thinking, I, I still don't fit in. I, I'm never in any of these pictures. And there's that little voice in the back of my head was saying that. I, it, then I began to, I don't fit in here anymore. I almost kind of regretted locating them because now you have this new feeling of I'm never going to fit in here. They're never going to. Because I wanted to see them more often. They're, they're the kind of see each other like every six months. But that, that's not going to work in my case. I want to see you guys at least weekly, you know, somewhere. Yeah. Talk to you, do something. For about six months, the siblings were seeing one another more often. But their older brother still was not ready to engage quite yet. It took about a year for Roderick to meet him. And even then, Roderick had to make the trip. He didn't go to meet Roderick. So everyone met each other, except for their missing younger sister, Renee. It turned out for many of the siblings, it was questionable who some of their biological fathers were. Renee's was very unclear, too. But one of the sisters Roderick had already met was also discovering her biological father's identity after 40 years of thinking it was someone else. So for her, she was making her own paternal connections and reconnecting with Roderick at around the same time. And believe it or not, the standoffish older brother also learned his own paternal beliefs were questionable. It was a big mess in the family at that time. And so you're trying to deal with all this and trying to, to love and place your biological mother in some kind of position in your life, in your mind. But at the same time, parts you go, well, what kind of person does this? What kind of person does this? Like I tried to have to push that back and say, well, whatever happened, I don't know, and I'm going to accept it for what it is. Right. Yeah. So, That's really smart is right. to not assign something to it, which is something that we do. You You look to place your emotions on something and – and you assign a problem to it. That might not be the right narrative. And and it's important to hold back from that and say, let me not pass judgment until I get real hard facts on what actually transpired. So that's, exactly. that's impressive you that you did You're that. never really going to know what's the sense of making a bunch of stuff up in your head. Pondering Roderick's paternal link, there was suspicion that his oldest brother and Roderick shared the same father because the two of them resemble one another so closely. But a brutal long wait for DNA testing results revealed they did not have the shared paternity they thought they might. Roderick turned his focus to another man who was unfortunately deceased, but who might be his birth father. He didn't have any leads on the man's kids, didn't know any of his relatives, but Roderick did locate one of the man's five wives. But the woman was standoffish, nearly hostile, and when Roderick said he didn't want any trouble, the woman finally gave up the information that his suspected birth father had a sister living in Indianapolis. Roderick is a data analyst and researcher, so with his skills, he located his possible paternal aunt. The woman was a reclusive 78-year-old, but since she was nearly at the end of her life, she didn't want to mess around holding secrets over time. So she told Roderick he could go over to her house to discuss things. Was adamant that it probably was the son because she knew her brother and her brother was kind of a jiggle. Oh, is so, that right? I'm like, okay, well, there's still no way. So the only way we're going to figure this out is she takes the DNA test. She had no problem with it. So I go to her house and she was shut in. So I'm opening the door and I say, hey, hey, I'm in here, Dolores. Her name is. She couldn't come to the door. I'm a little frightened because I'm like, hey, I'm going to somebody's stranger's house and they can't even answer the door. And she's back in this room where it's kind of dark. So I can't see her. But here's the funny story. From a distance, it looked like a black woman. I'm like, okay, this can't be, because I'm definitely white, but this can't be my... But I was like, okay, she's cordial enough. I'm going to go ahead and talk to her anyhow. I mean, this is a shut-in. I want to be nice, and we'll talk, and we'll interact, and we know it's a problem. But then when I turned the light on, she, she, was, it was, she was a white woman. So I thought it was funny, though. <laughs> yes, we thought I was a black woman. So we, we go ahead and take the swab, and 
and, and we're going to send off the DNA test. It's going to take a month, blah, blah, blah. He shows me the pictures of the dad, who, if he is my dad, and all the stuff he looks like. Yeah, kind of looks like me. I don't know. Then she pulls up this picture because I was talking about how we still have another sister out here floating around. Nobody has found her. Can't find her at all. Oh, yeah. He had another daughter, and here she is. It's probably your sister. Sure enough, this picture, of which looks like a stock picture from a foster home, just like the one I had, because I only have one picture, of this little girl. And now starts eating. Like, who is this? this? Her name was Renee. I'm like, I need to find her. Why didn't anybody else find her? Mm-hmm. She's two years old, and it can't be too hard, especially since there's contact here. And so for the next eight months to a year, my mission was to find her. Roderick did all kinds of research to find Renee. He found her birth announcement that definitely had his mother's name on it, and the guy's name who Roderick thought might be his birth father was on the document too. But it didn't confirm for Roderick that they were full siblings. It was around then that he had learned about confidential intermediaries who help with adoption investigations. He was suspicious about having to pay someone to find his sister, but after some digging, Roderick found an investigator who seemed legit. He put down $700, hoping for the best, and in 30 days, the intermediary had found Renee. The irony is, when she was 18, she also was looking. She worked for the Indiana Attorney General's office, and she had access to things that some of us don't have access to. And so she went to a family who shared the last name of her she thought was her biological dad, and they said that they were her family. She had no way of proving it back then. There was no internet, there was no DNA test, all that. But eventually they told her to stay away because it was causing issues in the family. So she just gave up her search. She goes, okay, they just don't want me. And she went back to live her life and never did the, the search again. So when I had my intermediary contact her at first, she was standoffish. She's like, eh, I've already been through this, and I don't want to go through this again. Being a curious type, she's like, oh, well, is this any of the names? And the intermediary said, no, that's none of the names that we have here. It's somebody else. But my intermediary still wouldn't tell her who I am, which is infuriating. I'm like, I'm an adult. Why can't you tell her who I am? I get why you can't tell me who she is, but mm. I've already told you to tell her. Right. But right. for whatever reason, the laws still say I'm, I'm not myself, I guess. I'm still not allowed to tell, my, tell other people who I am oh. by law. It's infuriating. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. So she eventually goes for it and goes, hey, okay, let me send my records to you. And she sends the records to the intermediary and she does some work and and eventually finds out that we're biologically related. We still don't know if we're full-blood siblings, but I still don't have the DNA just back. It was probably a week or so later, and I found out that way. I'm definitely related to my aunt, the one I located. I'm definitely related. Here's the, here's the dad. But I still don't know, now that I've found the sister, I don't know if she's related to me 100% because she hasn't taken the DNA test. Gotcha. You know, but we know she's we know she's related maternally. So she we wait another month to find out if she's related to me. <laughs> month, it's annoying. And month she, she after said month. she admitted to me. She goes, I was afraid that if it came back and I was not biologically related to you because for the maternally, that you'd be less enthused about finding me. I said, No, no, I would have still been enthusiastic, but it comes out that we were hundred percent biologically. We were the only ones that are hundred percent biologically related. The rest of them are half siblings, which again, adoptees don't like to use that half stuff because Siblings are siblings, but yeah, distinguish. Yeah, right. Just so you understand the relationship we're talking about. That's really unbelievable. Yeah. How, so now you've gone from meeting half siblings to meeting a full blood sibling. I mean, tell me about how that was for you. I know you said you're not well, much for emotion, but that had to be heavy. It was heavy, so heavy. You'll see here in a moment. Um, first of all, she was also went through my same condition because she was given up for adoption. He went to a different family altogether. He was raised by a different family who also had two other adopted kids, you know, two adopted boys. So she went through my family so she could relate to what I went through with my life on top of the fact that we're 100% siblings. And so I began piecing together because I pieced together my adopted family's uh, by, um, family tree all the way back to 700 AD. So I started doing that for this family, my biological one. I know more about our biological family than any of them do because I've done all the research for them, mm-hmm. going back and everything else. And so we find out that our, our dad and our aunt and our grandmother came over from Germany in 1952 right after the fall of, of the Nazis. They were escaping the Nazis. So we're direct descendants from these Germans. I know you just had uh, Nicole on, who's also a direct descendant in Germany. So here you got another backup. Mm-hmm. Um, so we see this, and we're, we're trying to piece together all of our heritage and everything else and seeing how we are, and, and we're spending more and more time. But the problem is 
as you said, I'm not emotional, but I think that might be a hindrance because those emotions are built up inside, and it was just eating at me. I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. I just wanted to interact with these people. I wanted to be around people. I wanted to learn more. And the sibling, the sister, she lives down in Florida, so I can't even see her. It was a month later before I actually could see her. That's tough because the anticipation is there. When you're so distracted, you want to just, like, let's keep this moving. I want to meet this person. I want to see her. I want to, you know, and you can't. That's right. so hard. And, right. And on top of that, I don't know if President Adopties go through this, but I know I did. I constructed a life, and it was really orderly and perfect and, and predictable because I needed that in my life as an adult. Mm -hmm. But now I didn't want that anymore because it seemed so fake and so so artificial. This is constructed. This is not who I am. It's not somebody else. And I just felt like running away from everything, running away from my career, everything. I didn't want to do anything else anymore. Now, a psychologist I know would say, well, you, know, it's you should have taken it slowly, blah, 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 and you should have came to counseling. Okay, no amount of counseling unless you're going to give me drugs and it's going to change the way I really feel. And I don't want to be, I don't want that turned off. I know it's, tumult it's tumultuous, but I didn't want to turn it off either. Yeah, and not to mention, like, who has the presence of mind in a, in a, for lack of better words, crisis situation to think, all right, stop, I need to go see therapy real quick. You know what I mean? Like, you've got all this information coming at you. There's these exciting developments coming your way. How do you even well, figure out? Well, some people actually suggested it because they saw, they saw my, my, my turmoil and they even suggested it. There were parts, times where, I'll go ahead and share this now, parts, even after I found everybody, I felt suicidal. Why? Because I was happier than ever because I felt like I don't want to ever be less happy than this moment. So maybe I should just end it. And that, you know, I've had motions of that. I think lots of people have emotions where they feel flashes of suicide through their life, but don't never act on it. Yeah, right. But it was really strong at that time. And it's like, oh my God, why, why am I having this? Because I finally analyzed myself. I was like, okay, it's because I'm at an epitome of happiness and I don't want to go down from there. That's really unbelievable. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of suicidality across the adoptee community and for a variety of reasons. And, and it's interesting to hear you say that from a place of being at the pinnacle of feeling right. good that you were worried that it could only go downhill from there and that you it was it felt like it might be just better to let it be that what it is from right there that's really interesting roderick was burning to get to florida to meet renee he had been putting off the trip but finally he and his younger sister and middle brother the two that drove to his home to meet him decided they were buying plane tickets and flying down to meet her. Roderick had video chatted with Renee before, so he was familiar with her. But after the plane ride from Indiana to Florida, the siblings were about to pull up to her house to stay for a week. I asked him what he was feeling when they were making the drive to her home. I got to know her a little bit beforehand, but I was still apprehensive, except for the part that I, I now started feeling guilty. I was like, oh, I... I have this I have this love for my my past siblings. I have this immense love now, connection wise, because of many factors for this sibling. Mm -hmm. Do they know? Can they sense that I have this and this excitement even more so than when I met them? It was obviously that was going through my head at the time. It was less about meeting her than making sure the other ones also realized I cared about them. They, they, the, the thing with the uh, adoptive kids too is that my older, my one brother, the one that admired me so much and, and I helped him, you could tell he was like, am I going to, you could tell the sentiment that I saw, am I being shoved out here? And I had to reassure him all the time, you're still my brother. You're still my brother. Wow. 100%. Yeah. So. Wow, that's crazy. So you get to your sib your sister's house. Tell me about that first meeting. Well, she, I guess, again, I, I, so I see it more now, but she has not only the looks of my mother, my biological mother, she has the mannerisms, which I wouldn't know anything about. So the two biological siblings are just floored. You behave like her. Your, your hair is decorated like hers. You, you, your hands, your hand movements, everything is like her. Your, your facial expression, it's, it's creepy, they said. So, but I'm not seeing it because I don't know anything about it. I'm yeah. just saying here's this person that is my 100% sibling. So it was strange trying to work through what they were sensing and what I was sensing. Yeah, that is really interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. You're in reunion with a full blood sibling, and you're standing there next to people who know your natural mother, but you don't know her natural mother. So they're talking about how much this other person is like your natural mother, but you've never met her, so you can't really relate. That's really interesting. Right. 
and I'm sure it's also hard for my 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 sister too because now to me, this is what I felt like. You're taking away her her unique personhood because you're seeing her as the mother, not as the sister in a way. Yeah. Not their mother, but you're seeing all the characteristics as your mother, so it's hard to see the individual person standing before you. Yeah. I kind of felt bad for her. That's really interesting. You have an interesting lens of empathy for other people. You're, you're really well, that, good that at whole, That's that whole outsider thing, observer thing. It's sort of thrown to play. Yeah, I guess that's right. You would have honed it by being in a position of observation your entire life. Tell me, how long did you stay in Florida? You don't just go to Florida for the day. Like, yeah, we, we, we only stayed like three or four days or over a weekend. And the leaving and departure, to me, was even worse because I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to have this relationship where I'm only going to see this person every six months. How do I work this? How do I get it to where, am I going to move to Florida? Is she gonna, am I going to urge her to move back to Indiana? Because she was from Indiana originally as well. She was mm-hmm. moving down to Florida with her, her aged dad. Mm-hmm. So they moved down there as a, um, what do they call them when they moved down there? Snowbird. So all this stuff is going through my mind too. And so the whole, you know, even month, a month after, I'm still thinking, how is this all going to work? But at the same time, we're also trying to plan a trip where she can come up and, and meet all these people as well. So what did you do? So she flies up and we're going around meeting all these people. And they were excited to meet me, but this was a strange feeling for me because they were super excited to see her. Because, again, they all thought I died. <laughs> they thought I was dead. They were excited to be me. I didn't do any, anything. But when they met her, it was just, oh, elation. And maybe because she's female, because she looks like the mom, and they all knew the mom. And and even though I was excited and happy for it, there was a part of me, a human part of me, like, oh, well, they don't care about me as much. And I had to fight back that. Yeah. Because there was a little whispers going on in my mind. Yeah. Because you've got a big thing going on, too. Like, the reunion you have initiated this reunion process, even though people, it sounds like, have been trying. Like, you were the one that actually made the connections. And you're also experiencing the jubilation of getting to meet everybody and connecting everybody. and, And But somehow, for lack of better words, you're not the star of the show. And even though you didn't necessarily want to be, like, that wasn't the goal. I know what you're saying, where... You, you're you part of this jubilation and you feel like you should be closer to the center, but this another person it has managed to garner the spotlight for whatever reason. I can I can imagine how that would have felt. Right. She did, you could tell she, she's the kind of person that doesn't like the spotlight, so she was like, oh, wait a minute. But I figured it would be more like, okay, here the, here's the two two children of, of this mother coming home. But I guess since I had already been met everybody else, it was more like her, so that's fine. The irony, though, is I do think that sometimes we have discussed with me and the, the sibling, the sister, that the process was so easy, really, when you think about it. At any point, any of these other biological siblings could have hired an uh, intermediary and found her that quickly, and me, possibly, mm-hmm. definitely her yeah. that quickly. Yeah. And so you're like, why didn't they do it? It's because people don't have knowledge. I mean, I didn't have knowledge, and I was an adoptee. I was trying to find people all the time. So I didn't yeah. know anything about any intermediaries, and I thought it was a scam, but it's not really a scam. Be careful. Be the right one. Roderick's aunt's DNA test came back and verified she was definitely a paternal aunt. His father's identity verified. Unfortunately, the man died one year before Roderick found everyone on Roderick's birthday that prior year. Roderick finally met all of his siblings and confirmed his full blood relationship to his sister who lives in Florida while he was living in Indiana. Renee is anchored to Florida to care for her father, but Roderick was really feeling like he wanted to see his sister more than a few times a year. At the time, he was tied to his wife and family, but Roderick's relationship with his wife was deteriorating. She wasn't able to grasp how much Roderick really wanted to see his siblings versus how much time he wanted to spend with her. Even before I found this 100% biological sibling, he couldn't share her time as much with me as I want to share with my biological siblings. Because for her and I, we met at an early age. She was 14 and I was 16. Mm-hmm. So all she ever knew was our relationship. And here I'm now 50 years old. And so our relationship broke up completely to the point of divorce. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, things happen for a reason. It's, it's horrible, but at the same time, as an adoptee, is like, okay, 
I've lived this constructed life that I created. I've made sure it's orderly and happy, and everybody's been happy in it. It's now time for me to live my last remaining 20 to 30 years, because typically you live, you know, 70, 80, how I went over it. So then I decided, okay, well, I'll move to Florida as well, so I can be closer to you. Wow. Yeah, that's not, you know, again, and, and the psychologist might say, you shouldn't do that, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't care what the psychologists say, because I want to be closer to the person who knows my experience and it's the same thing, and we're 100% siblings, and we love the thing is, I want to be, I don't want to be closer to us, so I moved down here. That's really amazing. How's it been being so close to her now? It's really great because, again, there's, like I said, the nature nurture. There's lots of things, our, our ideas and stuff are very much the same, even though we we're raised by two different families. Uh, her raised more than I was, I was kind of raised myself, but. Like one time I said, you know what I'd like to do? Because we were talking about all this, you know, bucket list things, because you know, all this, this amazing story is already amazing. But so we also talk about the bucket list. You know, I want to get an RV and just, I would like to get an RV and travel around, you know. Because, oh, really? That's what I've always wanted to do, too. But we didn't have much money because I didn't take much money with me, but she's also a good researcher and we found an RV. So now we own an RV. We travel around occasionally. Oh, that's cool. How awesome. Yeah. And so, we just hang out a lot. Roderick has lived in Florida with Renee for nearly three years now. He's broken free of his controlled, crafted life in the suburbs to a life he's always wanted to live next to a 450,000-acre forest in Ocala, Florida. Roderick has written a book about his experience called Together More, Rejection and Reunion. Well, the book we're talking about in this case is called Together More, Rejection and Reunion because it's talking about how as you go through rejection and reunion. Actually, part of the, the rejection reunion is once the aunt who I made contact with realized I was going to move down to Florida, she disowned me again. She disowned me and the, the sister because she wanted me to be there. Like, oh, we'll come back and see you. We will always interact with you. But she disowned me. She would not have that. Wow. So I got re we got rejected twice. It's called rejection reunion because there's lots of stuff that goes on there again. We could go into the sort of details of what happens with, with other relationships and stuff. And, and, you know, like I said, my wife and everything else. But we're not going to get into that. We're just going to focus on, obviously, that fact that, that this is where people end up and that things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. Everything happens for a reason, huh? Who knows where it'll go? I mean, it has inspired me. Because before, I've always wanted to be an author, but I never took the time to sit down and write. But being in the middle of the forest and being where I am now, I'm able, I've am able. i written already nine books. So That's that incredible. One. Wow. Span of three years. That's amazing. Dude, you're pumping out books. That's incredible. And you've got the space in your mind and, and around you to be inspired to do it. That's really awesome. Exactly. Cool stuff, Roderick. Well, I'm so glad you found your sister and your siblings. I mean, the whole family, regardless of the rejection that followed, to be able to move down to Florida with your full blood sister is just incredible. Really amazing, and I'm happy that you guys are able to spend time together. And Good for you for following your heart and saying, this is what I want, this is what I feel like I need, and I'm going for it. That's awesome. Right, right. Although, I mean, it doesn't come without, I'll say again, I don't want to make anybody think it's just wonderful because it doesn't come without tragedy. I mean, there's lots of people that are angry. How dare you leave everything? They would even try to use my, my other bio. Like, you found others, you found other good things, and you also abandoned them, which I haven't because I talk to them almost daily. But they'll use that as a, as a, you know, try to stab me in the back. And like, you, you also abandoned them. How dare you? Like, you don't get it. You're not adopted. You don't get the, the whole, I have no identity. I have, I know when I don't exist. I created this, this facade. This, I call it amnesia. If you're born with amnesia. Mm. And now I woke up at age 50 and realized that, wait a minute, this isn't me. And they get mad at you because they say, well, yeah, that's, that's who we've known all these, all our lives. We've known you as this person. I said, but that was never me. Than the grass. You're absolutely right. You nailed it. Well, thank you so much for telling your story, Roderick. I really appreciate you taking time, man. This is, you definitely have had some ups thank and downs, you. but it sounds like you're doing just fine. And I'm glad to hear that, dude. Thank you so much. Of and course. Thank you for the opportunity for adoptees. And you said you're an adoptee as well. So adoptees will tell these stories and get them out there. Yeah. It's my pleasure. It's my, I'm very lucky to be in a position to be able to help you guys share your stories. So. Thank you for being here with me, man. I appreciate it. You take care. All the best, all right? You too. Take care. Bye. Hey, it's me. 
Roderick shared an interesting perspective as an outside observer on his own life. He lived one of those reunion scenarios that's so challenging to overcome, coming back from the dead. And it was fascinating to hear how blown away he was to connect with his half-siblings and be united with a full sibling he didn't even know about. It was nice to hear that he tried not to pass judgment on his birth mother for the kind of person she was, but he admitted he did question what type of person she might have been. Despite his aunt's secondary rejection when Roderick moved to Florida, leaving her behind in Indiana, I liked hearing that he made the move to Florida to be with his sister. Think of how many times we've wanted to just pick up and start over somewhere new, and Roderick has actually done it. I'm Damon Davis, and I hope you found something in Roderick's journey that inspired you, validates your feelings about wanting to search, or motivates you to have the strength along your journey to learn. Who am I, really? If you would like to share your adoption journey and your attempt to connect with your biological family, please visit whoamireallypodcast.com slash share. You can follow the show at facebook.com slash waireally or follow on Twitter at waireally. If the show is meaningful to you, you can support me with a contribution to keep it going on patreon.com slash waireally. Please subscribe to Who Am I Really on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. It would mean so much to me if you took a moment to leave a five-star rating there. Those ratings can help others to find the podcast too. And if you're interested, you can check out the story of my adoption journey. Who am I really? An adopt